from Mark Twain going on a speaking tour to save himself from bankruptcy back in the 1800s to presentations online today. Public speaking works. It works because if people really enjoy your speech, they're going to want to buy a copy of your book. Authors who do public speaking sell 30 to 60% more books at an event when they're the keynote than when they simply have a book table. And we used to talk about public speaking a lot on the Novel Marketing Podcast because it's such a reliable way to sell books. But once the pandemic hit, most speaking opportunities went away and many public speakers went into hibernation. But I'm happy to say that in the U.S. at least, most speaking opportunities are back. And in some states, they've been back for a while. So how do you get started or how do you get restarted with your public speaking career? Or if you are speaking, how do you get more and better speaking opportunities? Well, that is what you're going to learn on this episode of Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. I'm Thomas Umstead Jr., CEO of Author Media, and this is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and make a living with writing worth talking about. And our guest on the show today is an international best-selling author and an award-winning professional speaker who is a member of the Speaker Hall of Fame. Jane Jenkins Herlong, welcome to the Novel Marketing Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. I'm honored to be here. Now, I know you didn't start off in the Speaker Hall of Fame. You started off not doing any speaking. So how did you get started at the very beginning back in the day? I had the privilege of being in the Miss America pageant as Miss South Carolina. And whether I liked it or not, I had speaking engagements and the bug bit. And I absolutely adore being able to share my heart. And a good first tip is find your lane. Well, I was 23 and I certainly didn't feel like I was qualified to speak to uh, married couples or about children's issues, but I could speak about rising above your circumstances and breaking barriers and trying to find the version of your best self. So I started doing school programs after my years, Miss South Carolina, and it just caught fire. And I just loved it. And I sang and I talked to kids and I just bloomed in the spot I was planted, so to speak. And that's how it all began. And imagine those didn't pay very well. Uh, typical elementary school doesn't have a big budget for public speakers, professional speakers. No. But what I would do, and this is another tip, is you seed your speech. You say things like, I love speaking for young people and elementary schools and high schools. But when I speak to teacher groups, you see? You're telling people exactly the next step. So that's a tip. Always be willing and ready to have that next level that you want to move to. In fact, that's one of the ways that I measure how effective a speech is. Because after a speech, people will come up and tell you it was a good talk just as a courtesy if they have a question or something, whether or not it was good talk or not. So the two ways I measure whether a speech was successful is one, if people were laughing, but two, if I got any invitations for other speaking gigs from the people in the audience. Because one time I gave a talk at a writer's conference and a lady came up and she's like, I'm doing a writer's event in Hawaii. Would you like to come and speak there? And I was like, yes, yes, I would. <laughs> Gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. And here's another thing. Ask people, okay, you liked it, but what did you like? What takeaways? And a lot of times, this is so crazy. Sometimes if you go in the ladies' room or the men's room and just uh, pull your legs up and listen, you'll hear. You'll hear how good you were. <laughs> listen, or how bad you were. Or how, yeah. Oh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> if you were really bad, you're going to hear, oh, that speaker. I didn't like them, blah, blah. But I always like to ask people because the worst testimonials you can get was, I loved your speech. Okay, great. Now, what did you like about it? What was your takeaway? What, what did it do for you? Uh, what can I share with other people? And that gives you things to work on for the next time. You get feedback because knowing what works is really valuable and then also knowing what doesn't work. What other advice do you have for getting better at public speaking? Be very brave. I always tell my speaker friends that are just, oh, we're just knocking it out of the ballpark and this is my big audience. I say, really? How about speak to a junior high on Friday at 2 o'clock? Then tell me how good you are. Because if you can hold that audience, you are a <laughs> ringer and a winner. They'll tell you how good you are or not, like we just said. But challenge yourself. Be uncomfortable and do a lot of free stuff. 
I worked with a client once who would develop independently published books to go along with his talks. And he'd also record really high quality presentations of those talks and put them together in bundles. And I remember he, fl- he flew me out to Seattle once because he's speaking at this big event, I don't know, 20, 30,000 people at the event. He wasn't the only speaker, but he was one of the speakers. And I'm guessing they probably paid him $5,000 for the speaking event, $10,000 for the speaking event. It's good money, but he sold probably thirty dollars to $60,000 worth of books in the back of the room across the weekend, which is why he needed me there because he, he had a whole team of people swiping credit cards because there's a line every time he'd speak to be a line around the room. And this is why being an author is such a great companion to being a speaker because having a book makes it easier to get speaking gigs because it gives you a little bit of credibility. But but it also helps you better monetize those speaking gigs because maybe you're not getting paid a whole lot, but you know you're going to be able to sell a lot of books that will then compensate for the money and vice versa, right? If you're an author, the speaking helps more people discover your books. So it's a really great win-win. And I always give away books when I speak and I give it away to the person in the back of the room, whether they want or not, because everybody gets to look <laughs> at it as they hand it back and touch it. And then I drive people to my... T- <laughs> I drive people to my table and say, hey, I've got a gift for all of you. And I give away a bookmark and it has a QR code on it. And they just hover their phone over. It takes them straight to my products page. So there are ways to be clever. And there are ways you have to collect those names for that all important newsletter. And I try to entertain and get great open rates. And so that takes a while. All of that is a package. So you have to collect names. Back when I was traveling and speaking all the time, before I had three small children that I stay home with, I had this glossy flyer that I took with me to every speaking event. On one side, it was glossy and had a bunch of information about our services, building websites and what Author Media was. And then on the back, it was matte and it just said notes and it had a bunch of horizontal lines so they could take notes from my talk and it was a heavy cardstock and so they could write on it. But then at the bottom, it was perforated and there was a place for them to put their name and their email address. And then they would tear that off and I would do a drawing and I'd give something away for free. And it was a really effective way of growing my email list. The only downside of that method was that somebody had to then type in all of those email addresses and decipher people's handwriting. And if you miss even one character, the email bounces. And so back when we did that, we had a higher than normal bounce rate. And it's important if you're doing that to send frequently to clean off those inaccurate emails off of your email program because a high bounce rate can hurt your deliverability. That's very true. Very true. For a long time, I wanted to do QR codes, but people didn't know how to make QR codes work. But now, post-pandemic, when all restaurants have QR codes, I feel like that works better. So I'm curious, for you doing a lot of speaking in the South, do you find that putting a QR code up on the screen, people will scan it and type in their email address? You know what? I always send out a pre-questionnaire And I strategically say, what are the ages? And if I see it's an older crowd, I know that dog's not going to hunt, point, or get off the porch. (laughs) But if it's a younger crowd, they're going to love it. And sometimes you give people the option. So here's the slide with the QR code. It has to be big, pretty much half the slide. And here's the URL you can take a picture of and type it in manually if you'd like to do it that way. So there are different ways. And for example, I just spoke to POW wives and in Greenville a couple of weeks ago, and they all got a book. That's another way to sell books. You ask the publisher, and you, if you self-publish, you can do it yourself, but you ask the publisher, what is the best rate I can give? So they ordered roughly 100 books, and it was a reduced fee. So everybody got a book. I signed every single one of them, and then when I got to the event, they wanted them personalized. And it, sometimes I forget to ask, like, hey, um, would you like a a really good price on this sweet tea book? And it normally will work. And I have sold hundreds of books that way. But people forget to ask, would would everyone like a book? So there's several things you said there I want to underline. First, the selling of your books. And this is a real important thing if you're traditionally publishing to talk with your agent about and say, hey, I really value being able to get author copies 
inexpensively. And this is one of those things that your agent can negotiate for, because if you're speaking a lot and you're buying copies of your book and then selling them at retail, getting your books for $4 a copy as opposed to $7 a copy really makes a difference. (laughs) And if you can get them at $2 a copy, so much the better. But something else, Jane, that you pointed out that I really want to underline, because this is something that's a big difference between professional speakers and amateur speakers, is you said you had a flyer or some sort of intake form to get to know the audience so that you can adapt your talk for the audience. That is a real marker. Being able to adapt your topic for the audience is really key. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you send to the event organizer to find out who's going to be there in the room? The first question I ask is what time, where is it located, and where am I supposed to be? The next question is what time does the event start? What time do I speak? All those are very valuable. That's just logistics. You would not believe how many times I've had to search through emails and waste my time. Who is going to pick me up if I'm flying in? Next question, what are the ages of the group? Next question, do you have a theme? Next question, what would you like the folks to walk away with? Now, that is key, Thomas, because that is what the very first slide will say. Three Sweet tea secrets too. And then I just fill in the new blanks. Increase laughter and reduce stress. That's exactly what they asked me to talk about. Is it a different speech? No. I might add different stories in there, but it's pretty much the same speech. The, the adage in speaking is it's easier to get a different audience than a different speech. But you have to keep <laughs> refreshing your material. And another thing you have got to do is take the time when you're marketing to get to know the folks and what their needs are. What tips do you have on getting event coordinators to book you to speak? See if you fit in and be sure that you say, I went on your website. When I do cold call, I think that's a lost art to get speaking engagements. And I have a spreadsheet. Today I was speaking. See, I'm a farmer's daughter, so farm bureaus are big for me. So I'll put in Farm Bureau, the contact, last time on a spreadsheet, and I'll go back to their website, and I'll say, hi, I'm updating my list. I have Tiffany Smith as the contact for the person who books your speakers. Is this person still relevant? Well, that gives me credibility because I've done my homework. I'm being honest, and I'm not just cold calling because that'll get you nowhere. And then I'll talk to Tiffany. I'll say, Tiffany, hey, I'm so glad I got to you. I'll leave her a voicemail or if I'm lucky enough to speak to her. And then I follow up with an email and I follow up again in a couple of weeks. And I look to see when I sent the last one. It's very strategic. And if you want to get booked and get some nice fees out of it, this is exactly what you do. And so a lot of times I'll say, I see where you had a friend of mine speaking last year. I'd love her. You know, we're similar. If you're looking for that type of message, I'd love for you to look at my website. And sometimes, Thomas, to be really granular with it, I'll produce a video and I'll say, hey, Joan, I just saw where your theme is reaching newer heights. I've got the nicest speech that's all about reaching heights. So you see, I am going to make myself so attractive they cannot turn me down. And then I'll say, I can do a break out session too. So you've got to be able to be multifaceted. And then with me, I can say, hey, uh, I sing the national anthem. I can kick off your meeting with a wonderful national anthem. So I'm a threefer. That's what I want to be. I want to be a triple threat and get that job. That's work. Honey child, it is work. Right. Identifying the places that need speakers and reaching out to them and calling and following up and recording the videos like to do this professionally. You have to wait for it. Do it professionally. It's more than just giving a good speech. It's doing the hustling, the smiling and the dialing and the work. It's not waiting for the phone to ring or it's like, oh, if only event coordinators will call me. If you really want to do more speaking, you have to actually reach out yourself and I know the telephone is scary. People don't like to be on the telephone, but there is something to be said about calling someone on the phone. (laughs) Yeah, it suits me. Be scared. I'll get that job. (laughs) Yeah. So here's another thing. Like this morning, I have a friend. I did a couple of big speeches in Tocoa, Georgia, a lot of Baptist churches. And I said, Jeff, I get your schedule. Okay. 
I'm going to call the people that where you have been. And I said, if I get the job, I'm going to send you a finder's fee. Although I'm going on your schedule. Full disclosure, if you have a problem with this, call me back. Well, I didn't hear from him. So I've been dialing for dollars today and calling different Baptist churches in the area that I see where Jeff has been. And my first line is, I'm friends with Jeff. I have a really fun, I call it Lawrence Welk on steroids. I have a fun little big band comedy program. I do theater shows. I'd love to do it for you all. So I put out some feelers today. This is what I'm telling you, Thomas. There is an audience out there for everybody. You just got to find them. And so you got to make it work. And only one way, there's only one way to make it work. You know what that is? Guess. Hustling? No. It's passion. You have to have a passion in what you do. If you don't, just do something else. But you've got to be passionate and excited to say, oh, it's Friday. I can't mark it tomorrow. Darn it. (laughs) But I'm excited because Monday's coming. That word passion is really a propos because the word originally meant suffering. Right, The passion of the Christ is the suffering of Christ, which means you have to be willing to suffer, right? You have to be willing to do the unpleasant things, right? We all enjoy, for most people anyway, enjoy the applause at the end of the speech, right? But you have to do the work to earn that applause, right? You have to do the work to get the gig, to get in touch with the people who are booking the speakers. You have to do the work to get a speech good enough and to practice well enough where you're able to deliver, right? Because there's a big difference between a thunderous applause and a polite applause, right? The people are clapping because they're so happy you're getting off the stage as opposed mm-hmm. to people clapping because they really enjoyed the talk, right? It takes hustle and you have to be willing to put in a little bit of suffering, right? The sweat and thorns and thistles is a part of our life. And if you're willing to fight past the thorns and the thistles, there is a reward at the end. That's right. And the thing that I've realized is you got to read your audience. I could be telling a story and I see people shifting around and I completely change it. So be ready and willing to change your material at the drop of a hat. Here's a good example. I was speaking for the Arkansas school nutrition industry. As soon as I walked in, I'm a Southern humorist and I was going to do comedy. Well, they were depressed. I can tell you right now they had had loss physical loss. Some of them had COVID deaths. And instead of them coming in the ballroom, and that's why you go early and stay late. You go early to get the field. You stay late to get more opportunities. And people were hugging each other and they were crying. And they were saying, I'm so sorry to hear, but well, I knew right then I had to change and I had to gradually lead them into the Southern humor because I had to feel their pain. I like to get to a venue early, not just to get a feel for the people that are there, but also to get a feel for the room and to check out the technology. Because I often find that when I present, I have very graphic, rich slides. And so if I'm giving a talk that's 30 minutes, I may have 100, 150 slides. So we're going through them really quick. I really need to be able to advance them myself. Often the venue is set up where it's the guy in the back is wanting to do it because he's expecting a bunch of bullet points and one slide every minute. And so I want to get there to get a feel for the tech, make sure that my computer can work with the setup with the AV guy, but also get a feel for the room because you'll be more confident on stage if you've spent some time in that room (laughs) because the first time you're seeing the room is right before you go on stage. It's a little disorienting. So you want to get a feel for the room. You want to get a feel for the people. And get a feel for how advanced the audience is on the topic, right? I don't want to tell them things that they already know, but I also don't want to tell them things that are so advanced that they don't know how to connect it with what they already know. And it's another important part. And I always get to know people and I sit down and I don't tell them I'm the speaker because they clam up. And I'll say, well, tell me what you do. Tell me, has it been hard during the pandemic? And so when I opened my speech, I said, Sarah was telling me, That shows that I have taken the time to get to know folks in the audience. And when they hear their name, they love it because I make them the star of the show. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, how much this organization has meant to her. So you learn to pull people in and walking around. I say, be like a cat, walk every corner, go to every nook and cranny. If you do your homework and you work hard at it, you're going to get multiple spinoff engagements. And then you ask the meeting planner, tell me some other people in the industry that will love 
what I do. Can you do an email introduction? And so that's really what happens. And it's word of mouth. Yeah, which is why the, doing the practice and preparing a good talk is so important. So what do you do? How do you approach preparing a new talk from scratch? For example, when the sweet tea secrets from the deep fried South came out, I was very challenged and I put myself in an uncomfortable spot. And I said, I've got a great new speech to go along with the book. I had it somewhere in my head, but I hadn't thought about it. And so I started thinking of tea. And what is three qualities to do with tea? And I said, the first one is seasoned tea. Seasoned tea, that to me, you want to be like that in life going forward because seasoned is wisdom. And I tell a story, a new story about a woman I met who was 92 years old. And I said, what's the secret? And she said, my favorite scripture. And I said, what is that? And she said, and it came to pass. I said, what? She said, that's in the Bible 737 times. She said, things will come and things will pass. And I said, now there you go. She said, when troubles come, they will pass. You need to tell yourself that. Well, that's very wise. So I use that analogy, and then I tell a funny Southern story to go along with it. I call it Southern story, just a funny story. And the next thing I thought, well, what else is it with tea? Well, steeped. What does steeped mean? Steeped is, are you the best version of you? Are you totally the person you're supposed to be? And I tell the story about my struggles going through life, my family struggles, and I try to make it funny because I am a humorist. And then the last one is steamed. And so, so I've got three in the, the alliteration of steeped, seasoned, steamed. And I have funny, funny stories about that. And my funny Southern stories are original. They're not jokes. And people come up to me and say, I'll never forget that point because you talked about that time that you got angry. So that's how I come up with my new material. I dive into the book and think, what do people want to hear? Jesus spoke in parables. And that's what we want to be. We want to speak in parables. And we use our material for the parables that teaches a life lesson. Yeah, I love how you start with the audience. And you're like, what is a message that will resonate with the audience and knowing who the kinds of audiences that you speak to is really important because if you're constantly speaking to different audiences, it makes selecting good stories harder. It makes picking a topic harder. And let me tell you something else, Thomas. This is very key. Record every single speech. I have a Zoom recorder. There are tons of them out there. It captures the audience laughter. You can hear what's working and what's not working. Now you have to listen to those recordings. You can't just record yourself. That doesn't do you any good. <laughs> you have to go back and listen. And this is where it's a job. You got to respect speaking and treat it like a real job. And when I first got started public speaking, probably for the first 10 years, I think I recorded every single talk and I listened to every single talk. And still to this day, I listen to every podcast episode multiple times trying to get better at improving being a podcast host. And that I don't think will ever go away. Yeah. Have you ever picked up material that's old that you can recycle? I mean, I know in, in technology that might not be something you can do, but I told a story one time, it's as old as the hills. And I retold it and everybody went, that was hilarious. We're so dang old. But guess what? There are new audiences coming <laughs> in every day. You can repeat some of those old stories. There are old dad jokes that have new children that have never heard them before. <laughs> They're yes. funny all over again. And the same is true for lots of kinds of humor. I wanted to hear your thoughts on virtual summits because I found that I've been speaking at a lot more virtual summits in the last year, partly because I'm turning down all in-person stuff, not because of COVID, but because of a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a newborn. <laughs> That's three good reasons to stay home. Well, I need to commend you on that. The worst mistake a speaker can make is believing every standing ovation is more important than their children. And I prayed and asked the Lord not to let my phone ring. And I can tell you, as the mother of a 32 and a 33-year-old, I have absolutely, last night we were all together. My son lives in Clemson, and it took him a while to get through college. God bless him. But we love each other, and we respect each other. And you can't put a price on that. You only get one shot to be a dad. So, Thomas, thank you for that. 
I enjoy being with my kids, so it's no burden. But it was a good way of connecting with new audiences. It's a way a lot of people discover the podcast. They hear me speak. But now virtual summits have started coming around, and I'm finding I'm speaking at more virtual summits than I was speaking in person. And it's way less of a time commitment because I'm not spending a day in travel to get there and a day in travel getting back. I do it from my home studio, and it often pays about the same, too. And, And it converts better to email because people are already there in front of their computer. So I offer them a free reader magnet or lead magnet that's appropriate for the talk. And a lot of people will race and go sign up to get that free thing. And now they're on my email newsletter. And so I'm like, gosh, I almost don't want to go back to in-person because at least for me, the virtual events are better on all the categories. Several people are like that. Absolutely. For folks like you that have very, very granular information, it is awesome online. And I've done several, but I love in person because I am a humorist and it's hard to get the energy when you are in a virtual environment. So those folks who have that sit down deliverables that people need to hear, they are cooking hard and it's really great. People like me are struggling more because it's more important for me to get in front of people because you know what, Thomas, I got to stay fresh. Yeah, it is rough cracking a joke in a Zoom meeting or in a webinar where all of the audience is muted. Because <laughs> it's like, it feels like you're bombing. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Um, sometimes you can see them physically laughing, but it is rough. So I totally understand. And, you know, you're going back to telling humorous stories. Stand-up comedy is very difficult. Of all the kinds of public speaking, it is by far the hardest. I would say it's even harder than open-air preaching. I can open-air preach. I did it in my younger years. But it is like jokes are hard, whereas humorous stories are easier. Because if it isn't funny... If it's a well-told story, at least it's still a well-told story and people don't know that they weren't supposed to laugh. But if you tell a joke and people don't laugh, that is rough. (laughs) Oh, man. I told a story I thought was funny up in Minnesota. Well, a couple of women didn't think it was too funny. So you got to be careful of your comedy. I mean, there, there are a lot of comedians out there that will not step their foot on a college campus. Not at all, because they get ridiculed, reprimanded, outed. And you got to be really careful what you say in your comedy. When punched. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's this new trend of punching comedians. <laughs> <laughs> Not just at the Oscars, but it's happening a lot where comedians now have to like, be re- ready to physically defend themselves. As people hear a joke they don't like. They feel like uh, physical violence yeah. is justified. So it's definitely a different environment in the sense that people are a little more sensitive, they're a little less willing to take a joke, and they're more willing to act. Like it used to be people just left in a huff, but now they try to get you fired or they try to hurt you physically. So yeah, comedy is risky and truth telling is risky because the comedians are taking on the role of speaking uncomfortable truths, the truths that people aren't allowed to say. And that's always dangerous. And it's always been the role of the comedians. The, right, the court jester was the truth speaker. So it's actually a very ancient role. And realize, if you want to be a comedian, that's what you're stepping into. You're st- stepping into the court fool role. And that's not for everybody. That requires a very certain kind of temperament. But I will tell you another little takeaway in your introduction, like in my introduction, I have two places that if I know people don't chuckle or laugh out loud, I'm going to have a hard time delivering my message. I'll listen for it. There are two places I strategically put in my introduction that the meeting planner is reading. And so all of a sudden I go, all right, should I be more funny or should I be more inspirational? Should I be more motivational? Because they're not in the mood to laugh. And sometimes after lunch, when carbs and protein start to fight with each other, you're going to have that sedate group and you've got to bring more energy to the platform. It's crazy. I did a program one time for a group and I did two breakout sessions. And the first one, people were dragging people back because they thought it was so great. And I appreciated it, but it was after lunch and they came up to me and they said, what happened? I said, carbs. (laughs) So let's talk about this. Let's say you've got the one o'clock talk at this conference and everybody just had spaghetti for lunch. I'll say one thing that I did one time because I'm up there and I'm looking at everyone and they're all just... They're all carb crushing. I can see it. And it was a writer's event. So I know writers are introverted. They're not very confident. So I had them all stand up and find someone they didn't know and tell them like the biggest thing they learned at the conference so far. So I forced them all into a very 
uncomfortable situation that caused an adrenaline spike of all these poor, shy authors are having to have a conversation with a stranger. And I, I basically sacrificed five minutes of my talk and I had to cut a part of my talk. So I didn't get more time to do that, but it totally saved the talk. After that, the energy in the room was higher. People were in better spirits because even shy people like talking with strangers, especially if the other person's just as awkward and shy as they are. And then people were laughing at my jokes. Yeah. I have a friend that she sings, my bonnie lies over the ocean. My bonnie lies over the sea. And every time she sings bonnie, they have to stand up. Yeah, so what do you do? You've got that one o'clock talk. They've all just had a whole bunch of bread. Uh, What do you do to to wake people up again? Well, if it's an all-female audience, I sing my, if you're a healthy person, clap your hands. And it's funny. It's got some really great lines in it. If you're a healthy person, clap your hands. If you've had a mammogram, clap your hands. And so if your breast (laughs) you have checked in the shower when you're wet, if you're a healthy person, clap your hands. So I'll start out with that and I'll say, how many of y'all have taken care of your health needs? And by the way, on the card that you have, put a star and I will email to you that YouTube video and a sheet to put on your mirror so you can checklist the things that you need to take care of and the doctor's appointments you don't need to miss. So I'll do something like that. And so I'll sing and then I'll go in the audience and I'll put the microphone in people's face and they'll sing with me. So I have ways of waking people up. So what all of these have in common, your friend, what I do and what you're doing is it makes people a little bit uncomfortable. And you may be like, but that you should make people feel uncomfortable. It's like, well, that's a tool in your tool set. You don't want to do that for the whole talk, making people feel uncomfortable. But if what you have to say in your speech is really important and they are struggling to stay awake because they're sleepy, making them feel uncomfortable can wake them up so that then they're in a place where they can hear your speech, right? You have to prepare the way. Sometimes you have to prepare your own way. Hopefully you have somebody introducing you who's been trained in professional public speaking and they know how to set the tone and prep the room and get people excited. But in my experience, speaking at the kind of conferences I speak at, that never happens. (laughs) Typically it's a conference organizer or some random person and they just read what's in front of them. And then it's up to you as the speaker to prepare the way. And so you're the professional. Prepare the way. Get people ready to hear what you have to say. That's right. And then make your introduction easy. Don't put all these big words in there and people struggle and stumble. And make sure that person doesn't do a keynote speech introducing you. And I can't stand that. When there are people in front of you that they've asked, we're going to have so-and-so say a little something. Well, that little something turns into 20 minutes of something. Then you got another problem. you got to jack those people right back up. The introduction is tremendously important. So what are some tips that you have for getting invited back to the same venue? Because this is one of the things that's really great as a professional speaker where you have a circuit of places that have you back over and over again. And that's how you're able to cover the bills, knowing for sure these five or six places will have you back every year or every other year. It's funny you mentioned that, Thomas, because I was just doing that. I reached out to a client of mine who's at the Chamber of Commerce. And I said, hey, Tanya, I want to send you my new book. And she and I are good friends, so it's not the random send the book to type thing that gets just put somewhere, given away. And I said, I've also got a speech for women in leadership. And so it's a new speech. It's new material. And I'd love to chat with you about it and send you a video. And you just keep producing new material. Yeah, and just keep practicing. It's more important early on in your career to practice than it is to get paid. And this is why it's important as you're getting advice, you're listening to somebody like Jane, who's in the Hall of Fame. She's been doing this professionally for decades. For her, she always gets paid, right? I mean, you might do some charity events here and there, but you're a professional speaker. You get paid for speaking. That's not going to be the case if you're just getting started because it's hard to practice public speaking in private, right? You can practice in front of your mirror, in front of your spouse, but that only helps so much. That doesn't teach you how to read a room. It doesn't teach you how to get a feel for the emotional tenor of a room. You got to practice. And when I was first getting started, I would speak at people's living rooms for them and their five or six friends, right? They gather their four or five friends who are authors. They'd sit on the couches and I'd present using their TV as a projector. And I wasn't getting paid for that. And it was in that context that I practiced and got better so that I could earn the bigger stage. And so... Eventually, it switches where you're like, hey, I've been doing this for a while. I'm good enough. 
and you'll get tired of doing it for free. Yeah. So you're like, look, if you want me to come and speak, you're going to have to pay me. And then you start negotiating that rate higher and higher. And the more demand there is for you as a speaker, the higher you set your rate so that you're not burning yourself out because you can price yourself too cheaply. You're given 100 speaking events a year and you're every day you wake up and your first question is like, what day is it? And then you're like, what state am I in? <laughs> It's like, yeah. Oh, that's for sure. And then w- negotiating, my good friend, Doc Blakely said, the first one that s- speaks after you quote your fee loses. So you shut your mouth, you quote your fee, you put it out there and they can always negotiate down, but you can't negotiate up and you have to g- let them know the value you-, you bring. And that would be testimonials. And so there's a trick to it. But I have a friend, Al Walker, who always tells new speakers, send me your hundredth speech and then I'll help you. He's not going to waste his time with the new speaker. I mean, he's a great guy, but he knows that you've got to get that hundredth speech on. And he would, it, this is the back in the days of cassettes. He send me your hundredth cassette because you do get better and better and more comfortable. And you have to learn to walk a stage and you have to learn to move. You have to learn what looks good on you. You have to have fashion sense. That's right. And how to manage your energy. So a real common thing early on in your career, you're about to get on stage and you're feeling nervous or you think you're feeling nervous. And that energy, how you interpret that energy is one of the big differences between an amateur and a professional. And this is true not just in public speaking, but especially in sports. Because if you're telling yourself, I'm excited, that energy Mm -hmm. helps you perform really well. If I'm not at least a little excited going into a speech, I'm unable to do my very best performance, right? If I'm not at all excited or or nervous, right, you choose the word, then I don't have the energy to really perform really well. And it's about using that energy to enhance your performance, right? You're in the Olympics and you're about to run for the gold medal. If you're not at least a little bit excited, you're not going to win (laughs) because you know what everybody else on that track is? They're excited. They're not nervous. They're excited. And so being able to navigate that energy and channel it in a positive direction as the old chestnut goes, right? It's not about getting rid of the butterflies in your stomach. It's about getting them to fly in formation. And that's one of the things you navigate early in your career is how to use that nervous energy to make you perform better, not worse. And the late, great Zig Ziglar always said, love your audience and they will feel your love. And he is right you stand up there and you just love them and you let them know that this is a tremendous honor that they have taken their time to sit in a room and listen. And if you feel it in your heart, it will come through your mouth. I promise you that. You're talking about one of the things that helps set your fees is testimonials. And so what is the trick to getting good testimonials from your speaking events? Well, This is so crazy, Thomas, but I've even said to somebody, can I write my own testimonial and you sign it and approve it? (laughs) I've done that. you got to strike when the iron is hot. You write them a thank you note, write, not email, write them. And a lot of times, and I have a set of cards and it says on the cover, thank you a latte. And inside I put a Starbucks card or whatever. And just thank you so much for asking me. Enjoy. Put your feet up. It was a tough conference. You did a great job. And it's all about making the meeting planner look good. By the way, I'd love a testimonial. And I have gotten amazing testimonials just from asking. The last one I got, by the way, this was good. And I said, if you can add bullet points, what people said. And she did. And that was gold. That is gold. And that's what you want to do. And please tell me other folks that might enjoy what I do. What other tips do you have on combining speaking and book sales? I did a group called Area Churches Together Serving. And I charged a lot for my books that day. And I told the audience that I was going to give a percentage back to the organization. And I did. And I raised lots of money and was able to stroke them a check, several hundreds of dollars, to give back to this group. That's another way to both speak and sell books. You could say, you know what, I've got a new book. I know you're raising money. Why don't I come and do a presentation? I will sell books and I will give you all, every book I sell, I'll give you $5 off the top. And that's a way for people to have a fundraiser. So it exposes you as an author slash speaker. And it also gives back. 
I had a group one time, Thomas, it was a bunch of realtor women. And it was, I said, hey, y'all, my speech is called rhinestones on my flip flops. When life flips, don't be a flop. And let's give flip flops to a homeless shelter. You would not believe the amount of shoes those women brought. And it gave them incredible PR. We went to the homeless shelter. They had the newscast there. What did it do for me? Free publicity. Our speaker was Jane Jenkins Herlong. Her topic was rhinestones on my flip-flops. When life flips, don't be a flop. And we decided to collect shoes for this homeless shelter. Hey, homeless shelter people, tell me, oh, those women, they love flip-flops. And people even gave high heels. And they're all going on job interviews. This is a, a battered women's shelter. So, oh, my gosh, what a gift this was. I just got exposed to one of the three big TV stations in Columbia, South Carolina. And it was a big, giant commercial for me. That you didn't have to pay anything for and you're benefiting the homeless all at the same time. That's brilliant. Right. And you're giving back. It was for them. And so I do that all the time. I try to think of ways I can give back and make a difference because that's really what's happening. I love that. Jane Jenkins Herlong, where can people find out more about you? Just go to janeherlong.com, J-A-N-E-H-E-R-L-O-N-G.com. I'm on Amazon, of course, and where most books are sold in different bookstores. But go to my website. I'd love to collect more names and share the funny bits and get booked. And I'm raring to go. I'm ready to roll. And thank you, Thomas. This has been a real treat. Yeah, we'll have a link to Jane's website in the show notes. If you're looking for more help when it comes to public speaking, I encourage you to check out my course, The Art of Persuasion. This course is adapted from a training that I used to give competitive public speakers back in my days as a speech and debate coach. In this course, you'll learn how to be more persuasive, how to connect with your audience, and ultimately how to move them emotionally so they want to do what you want them to do. It's a great fun course. It's not very big. It's not very expensive. And you can learn more at authormedia.com slash courses. And if you're a patron of the podcast, you can save 50% off the price of the course. Speaking of patrons, our featured patron today is Jonathan Schruger, author of Shades of Black and Darkness Cast. A young swordsman desperate to save his people turns to the only instructor he can find, the bitter champion of the everlasting dark. They know the light best who first knew the dark. Jonathan Sugar, thank you so much for being a patron of the Novel Marketing Podcast and helping keep this show on the air. And real quick before we go, there's somebody listening. They're wanting to get their first speaking engagement. They're listening to all of these advanced things that we've been talking about, and they're feeling really intimidated. So what encouragement do you have for somebody who's trying to put their toe into the water for the very first time? Rotary, any women's groups. If you know some churches, maybe you can speak at a Bible study. Maybe there's an opportunity in your town to give back at an event. And just think outside the box in one respect and just look around, ask, is there an event that I can present? Some people go to Toastmasters and they speak and they'll evaluate you, a local Toastmaster. If you have a speech and and here's another takeaway, Thomas, if you have a speech, you have a book. If you have a book, you have speech. That's right. And that's a good way to start. Very much so. Toastmasters is a great place to get started. And then once you have learned what Toastmasters has to teach, the second organization is the National Speakers Association. I would say Toastmasters, the focus is on giving a good speech, whereas NSA, the focus is on building your public speaking business. So it's partly on giving better speeches, but it's also a big focus on getting more speaking opportunities and getting paid more for the speaking opportunities that you're taking on. If you're wanting to go deeper as a professional public speaker, NSA is a great organization to check out. Jane Jenkins Herlon, thank you so much for joining us today on the Novel Marketing Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. Loved it. The Novel Marketing Podcast is a production of Author Media. Our producer is Lori Christine. This episode's audio is edited by William Umstadt, and the blog post is crafted by Shauna Lettler. To read that blog version of this episode, go to authormedia.com slash 332. I'm Thomas Umstadt Jr. saying thank you for listening and live long and prosper.